One. I have some interesting neighbors. Let's call them Methany and BJ. They rent the property that creates an L shape next to and behind my property. At first, we were cool. Methany would talk to me over my chain link fence about her self made drama with her boyfriend, BJ's eldest daughter. We had a falling out because one day, when we're in the peak of COVID, plus WTF is this. Hubs 2.0, the upgrade is watching co-workers die from the complications of the disease. Methany, after telling me of drama, decides to sign off our little chat with, oh, By the way, I tested positive for COVID. So that went down like a nuke. I cut off all ties and had an eight-foot wooden privacy fence built. Methany was so mad she came to my door and pounded on it. I had to call the cops. But this is Florida and she wasn't on the property, so they didn't trespass her. Not even with our CCTV footage. I live in a ghetto. Now, there's other shit these clowns did to make me not like them, but you're here for a damn skunk. Methany and BJ have an interesting solution to needing an alarm system, because they're wackadoos who think the government is out to get them. They refuse to pay for a monitoring system, but they're concerned about the company they keep, and that they'll steal or otherwise wish them harm. To solve this, they got four yappy little dogs. These little shits bark at anyone or thing that passes by the front gate. BJ ran over one a few years ago. It was dark, Methany wasn't minding them, and the dog was sleeping under a warm van. <sighs> I have a pit bull, buddy. He's the worst car dog on the planet, as everyone is friend-shaped, but he had one issue, which I have now trained out of him. He's so smart. Fence aggression. So, as the yappy dog collection grew, Buddy got more aggressive. Again, he's over it now and ignores them. But Buddy would go out with my little kids, and they weren't very good at getting Buddy to listen. I'd be going out multiple times in the evening, calling or physically removing Buddy from the back fence. Now, ask me, was Methany and co. pulling their yappy dogs away from the fence? <laughs> no. No, the residents that I could see through the brush and the fence would stand, arms crossed, and watch me deal with my dog, but wouldn't call or pull their dogs away. I'm a suspicious person. I think they're trying to make an incident with the dogs in order to sue me or otherwise get back at me, but I don't know, I smelled a skunk. So I was done chasing my dog away from one section of fence not blocked by my privacy fence. I figured if I put down something really nasty smelling, neither Buddy nor the Yappers would want to come and fight. And I was right. And so very, very wrong. The skunk essence really did the trick. Buddy avoided the area like the plague. Once he bounded into the skunk top area. Once. Now the oil's all over his paws, and the kids just let him inside. Now it's on the carpet. I had to deodorize the house, and the skunk smell would waft into the house from the back door for a week or so. Buddy stopped his behavior. The yappers didn't. They didn't give a crap about the smell, and would still run to the skunky fence if they heard us come outside. I was saddened that it stopped after two days. Methany and BJ figured out where the smell was coming from and would grab the dogs away from the fence. So I enjoy thinking about what Methany and BJ had to endure if it was half as bad as the smell Buddy had on him. Times four little dogs that got up in their beds, couch, and carpet everywhere. Gleefully. Two. I work for an airline that flies all over Asia. On one Shanghai layover trip, I was paired with a first officer, known to have a chip on his shoulder. He'd actually joined the airline ahead of me, but for whatever reason, was still languishing in the co-pilot's seat, while most of his contemporaries had already progressed to captain. It wasn't that he was a bad pilot, his stick and rudder skills were actually quite good, but his attitude left much to be desired. He was known to grumble openly about still being in the co-pilot seat, blaming his failed upgrade on management pilots or instructors 
whom he thought had it in for him. I could sense he felt his seniority in the airline overrode the captain's authority in the flight deck. He was pushy, and liked to make decisions without consultation, even if they weren't his to make. Other captains agreed with this assessment. We were on a two-night layover. The flight itself went well, and we checked into the hotel just past midnight. As we headed to our rooms, he asked if I had any plans. I said I wanted to visit a far corner of the city to see the sights, culminating in late lunch at a century-old restaurant known for its soup dumplings. He asked if he could go, and I said I would be happy to have him along. We agreed to meet for breakfast at 9 a.m. and leave the hotel by 10.30. 9 a.m. sharp, I was at the hotel cafe. First officer was nowhere to be found. As a courtesy, I waited ten minutes before deciding to eat ahead. I was nearly done by the time he waltzed in at around 9.35. He acted as if nothing happened, and I thought nothing of it. Perhaps he was just tired from our late-night flight and needed to catch a few more winks. After chatting briefly over breakfast, I decided to go back to my room to get ready. We agreed to meet in the lobby at 10.30. At 10.30 sharp, I was in the lobby, but first officer was nowhere to be found. He wouldn't show up for another 20 minutes. No apologies, no explanations. He just sauntered into the lobby, acting as if nothing happened. I again brushed it off and went on our way. The following day, I wanted to do some shopping. Again, first officer asked to tag along, and again he was late for breakfast and the lobby meetup. At that point, the thought occurred to me. Like some dickwad who thinks showing up last makes him the most important person in the room. First officer was engaged in a deliberate power play, meant to drive home the fact that I was his junior. I'm a staunch believer of the maxim, don't get mad, get even. First officer needed to be put in his place, but how? Telling him off would be too easy and too crass. I wanted to be more subtle, but didn't know how. Yet... By mid-afternoon, we were back at the hotel, resting for our flight home. The cruise shuttle was scheduled to pick us up at 10.30 p.m. At around 8 p.m., the phone rang. It was the front desk manager relaying a message from our ground handler. Due to a weather-related delay, our departure time would be moved back two hours. This meant that our hotel pickup would also be moved back two hours. I thanked the manager, and was about to put the phone down when he asked, would you like me to inform your colleague as well? At that very moment, a not a little thought, Colonel, that had been germinating in the nether regions of my consciousness, exploded into full bloom. I now had my payback. And it was going to be... interest-bearing. Oh, don't bother, I said. I'll call him myself. And with that, I put the phone down, reset my alarm, and went back to sleep. At 12.30 a.m. sharp, I walked into the hotel lobby. First officer was there. He'd been for the past two hours. Oh, didn't anyone tell you our flight was going to be delayed? I asked with feigned surprise. He shook his head glumly. Sorry to hear that, I said. So sorry to hear that, I said, somewhat too sympathetically. Anyway, shall we go? Shuttle's here. I turned towards the door and quickly walked away. It was all I could do to hide that diabolical grin. 3. I was a professional military hard hat surface supplied deep sea diver. At this point of the story, I had been diving for over 15 years. My training was extensive. Two diving schools, one was 13 weeks long, five days a week with minimum of eight hours a day training, and the other was 17 weeks long. The first one involved quite a bit of science, medicine, and theory. It also involved long hours of physical training and in-water practical training and experience. The second one involved learning hyperbarics, mixed gas, demolition, supervisory skills, and salvage training, along with refreshers on the gas laws and medicine. To even get to the second school, you had to have a couple of years of practical experience working as a diver first. You had to complete prerequisites for both schools and apply, and not everyone gets in. 
Once in, you still have to meet quite a few demanding requirements along the way. My first school called Second Class Diver School had almost 30 people start and only 11 graduated. My second school, called First Class Diver School, started with over 20 people, and we graduated seven. Those who did graduate were exceptional. I was sixth out of seven in First Class Dive School, and I had a 96.7%. I was third in Second Class Dive School academically. I knew my stuff. Second class dive classes with instructors. This is not the unit that was involved with this story. This was one of my dive school classes at NDSTC Panama Beach, Florida. All divers have to make requalification dives to stay current. It's not a hard requirement to meet as long as you are diving. I stayed on active duty for 12 years. Due to a marriage and wanting to spend more time with my family, three kids, I left active duty and went into the reserves. I found a reserve dive unit. Some dive units have non-divers, but we get to recruit those. So they tend to be some of the best people in the military. Officers are a bit different. Sometimes it's hard to find diving officers in reserve units. If you made it through dive school, you did something pretty incredible. But sometimes there isn't much we can do about character. I would say that well over 90% of the divers I worked with were all hard-working, exceptionally intelligent people. They were all unique in their own ways. There are always going to be a few bad apples, and usually they get weeded out by their own actions over time. Our executive officer, Exo, was a lieutenant who previously was a navigator on planes, and bucking to become both lieutenant commander as well as commanding officer of our unit. In theory, he knew diving stuff, but his knowledge was mediocre at best. He would read upon stuff the night before, then come in to try to question and test our knowledge over the weekend. This is important to the story later. He would also focus on a particular part of uniform when it came to inspections. If his shoes were shined, then he would focus on that. If he got his hair cut, then ours would be on focus. He regularly had an unclean uniform or something would be out of place. His nitpicking was annoying, because there was a pattern to it that everyone saw. He would regularly bow out when we went out on the town, leaving everyone else to cover his part of the bill. This is aggravating to enlisted people when officers do something like this, because they get paid much more and have extra money coming in specifically for this part of their pay. In reality, I think he was having a hard time outside of the reserves, working job to job, paycheck to paycheck, while some of the enlisted guys had some well-paying jobs outside of the reserves. In short, they didn't do it for the money. Regardless, he was the only officer I met in my career who would be stiffing his people with the bill. As for his diving skills, he didn't have enough experience to call himself a working diver. He got lost in 20-foot depth of water, going 30-foot across an area. It took him close to 10 minutes to find the work site when it took most guys less than 2 minutes doing the same thing on one job. So the story. We were doing open water dives in scuba for requalifications. We probably had close to 12 to 16 people diving at one time with two chase or dive boats. No one else liked to dive with him before this because he wasn't good in the water. And talking with him was just torture. His confidence levels didn't match his skill level. Before this, I would dive with him because I could tolerate him. The dives took place in a bay known for good recreational and abalone diving on the Pacific. They drop everyone off in the water, and at the given signal, everyone goes down. The time for our dive has started. He didn't see it and the boat is about 50 yards off, and insists that we wait until the dive boat comes over and gives us the signal. We are the only people left on the surface. He decides that while we are waiting, he is going to quiz me on the gas laws and theory. I still knew my stuff, but I wanted to get diving. After about 20 minutes, he still wanted to quiz me and was refusing to go down. I had enough. I was a pretty thin guy at the time, and although I have a good wetsuit, treading water and sitting still in one place on the surface will get me cold after a while. 
I ask him one more time if we are going to dive, and he refuses to go down. This is in cold water, and treading water on the surface is not why I am there. I am there to dive, not play games or be quizzed by someone who can barely tie their own shoes, let alone dive. I start swimming for the beach, leaving him behind. I am a much stronger swimmer, so I leave him in the dust. I get to the beach and tell the other divers what he has done. About this time, he gets up to the beach and tells me we are going back in and are going to go down. I tell him that I'm done diving for the day. I tell him I am not going to be diving with him again, period. Diving is a volunteer program in the Navy. You can refuse to dive even if ordered. I may have been pushing it a bit, but stand my ground on this. He tries to get me to say I'm done being a diver and I'm giving up my qualifications. I make it very clear I am not diving today and I am not diving with him. He looks to another diver and that diver says, Sorry, I have a stuffed up nose. I can't dive. He looks at another guy and gets, I have a cold or along those lines. Each diver there does it. We have a little rebellion that I inadvertently started. He gets angry now and tries threatening me, but I stand my ground. He goes to complain to the CEO, who also happens to be a diver, quite a good one too. All the men stick up for me, and as I said, he wasn't a good diver. He lacked social skills when dealing with the guy, so wasn't well liked anyway. The CEO and I have a chat later with no one else around. I tell him the whole story, and how the other guys don't really like diving with this idiot anyway and all his other little games he plays. I got my requal dives the next day. No one dives with him that weekend. It turns out that he ends up never diving with anyone else at the unit again, to my knowledge. And when the CO retired, he got someone else to show up on his retirement date to take over as CO of the reservist unit. Shortly after that, Exo left our unit, and I think didn't go back to diving again. I didn't get ridden up, or in trouble in any way, because when I refused to dive, I did it in a way that was acceptable, and was very careful about what I said. Four. I went to middle school in the early 2010s, right before smartphones really took off. I got my first phone right before starting sixth grade. It was a side phone with a pay-as-you-go plan that cost 10 cents per minute for calls and per text message sent or received. Worse yet, sending or receiving photos cost 25 cents each. It was very expensive, and my parents only gave me $100 a year for this. If I exceeded the amount, I had to cover the rest with my limited birthday and Christmas money I had. Fortunately, most of my friends were good about helping me preserve the balance. They would call, and I'd let the call drop, but immediately call back on a landline so it wouldn't count as a call. And they'd email me or message me on Skype for most things. Everything was good until Derek joined the group in 7th grade. At first we thought he was funny, but we quickly got fed up with him, as he was very unpleasant and exhibited many antisocial behaviors. He started drama within the friend group and also caused issues between us and the other kids outside of the group. He was manipulative and always played the victim when others rightfully called him out on his shit, and he knew how to charm parents, so getting rid of him was easier said than done. He was the one friend who didn't respect my phone situation. He very frequently texted me dumb memes, even though I told him multiple times to just email or Skype them to me instead, since picture text messages cost 25 cents each. Unfortunately, blocking phone numbers was a feature that was unavailable for this pay-as-you-go plan. So there was nothing I could do as he spammed my phone. One day, he got mad at me for some reason and spammed my phone with memes. He must have sent me over a hundred lolcats over text. He kept sending them until I lost service since my phone balance was depleted. I had lost the remaining $40 in my account as a result. I was extremely pissed and demanded that he pay me the $40 he had cost me, and he refused and said it wasn't his problem. I got home from school really upset and told my dad about the situation, expecting him to go and tear Derek's mother a new one and demand the money. 
but my dad said that it wasn't worth the battle. I even asked him about his small claims court, but he said that not all battles are worth fighting, and that the effort wasn't worth $40. He took me to the carrier's store and loaded $50 onto the phone. The carrier changed my phone number and they managed to block Derek's number. They had initially said that blocking phone numbers wasn't possible with this plan, but my dad insisted and would not leave the store until they did it. I was extremely paranoid about my phone number being leaked and other kids spamming it to mess with me. Fortunately, my parents got iPhones that summer and got me one too, and the new family plan had an unlimited text plan. Nonetheless, I was pissed at the $40 he essentially stole from me out of malice. Fortunately, not too long after, there was a big blowout between Derek and the rest of the friend group at the end of the school year, and we permanently kicked him out of the group. He was an outcast the following year in 8th grade, nobody was tolerating him anymore, and he changed schools a year after and we never heard from him again. Fast forward to a few years ago, I was back home for a few months between graduating college and starting a new job on the other side of the country. I went out to some garage sales one Saturday morning, and I ended up at Derek's house. I recognized his mother, but I don't think she recognized me. I guess glasses and a beard is all you need. I noticed some Pokemon napkins out for sale, and when I picked them up to look at them, Derek's mom said that her son had been obsessed with Pokemon for his whole life, and that she was tired of Pokemon stuff occupying her home for so many years. I said that these napkins were for my younger cousin who is really into Pokemon, and asked if she had any more stuff. She said she didn't know people were still into that, and there were a few boxes in the attic with her son's old stuff. She actually took me inside the house, which I never imagined I'd set foot inside ever again, and let me climb up in the attic ladder and take down several large boxes to look through. The first one had Christmas ornaments in it and other junk, but I freaked out inside when she opened a box jam-packed with Pokemon video games in the original boxes, though I kept my cool on the outside. The whole reason I had agreed to go inside in the first place was because I was holding out hope of this exact scenario happening. See, I knew Derek was obsessed with Pokemon. Our friend group liked Pokemon back in the day, even when other kids thought it wasn't cool, but Derek was on a whole different level. He bragged about his collection all the time. At the time, he had every single main series game in the original box and in mint condition, as he always had to add in. I went to his house once, and he was showing me his collection. He yelled at me for touching one of the games. Nobody was allowed to touch them except him. He had many older Nintendo games in excellent condition, but Pokemon was his favorite. He had a couple of incidents with his mom damaging or throwing away his things. It wasn't out of malice, but just ignorance, as she didn't think the games or collectibles had any value. Fast forward into the present day, I was thinking about this when I asked his mother if she had any other Pokemon stuff. She ended up bringing out the mother load. We opened all the boxes she had me bring down. Within the boxes, there was the beloved collection of Pokemon games, all very well preserved, as well as several Nintendo consoles, hundreds of games, two dozen binders full of Pokemon cards, and there was also a box of many Lego sets with the original boxes and everything, with many old Star Wars sets. When I saw Django Fett, I knew I struck gold. I told her that I liked old Legos as well, and asked her how much for the five boxes of games, cars, and Lego sets, and she thought for a second and said, $100 a box, or 400 for all five. I told her I would take it all, and hauled ass to get to an ATM. I loaded the five boxes into my dad's truck, and immediately drove home. I knew there was potentially tens of thousands of dollars of goods here. This was the score of a lifetime and I finally felt vindicated for the $40 Derek had taken from me all those years ago. I ended up giving all the stuff to my uncle, who is a hobbyist eBay reseller. He offered to sell it all, he was willing to go through the effort and sell everything individually, and despite my insistence, he said he wouldn't take more than a 10% cut of the profits after all fees and taxes. We went through and logged every single item, along with the estimated value, and the total of the whole lot was about $40,000. 40,000 was a poetic number, 
since this was 1,000 times the value of what Derek stole from me all those years ago. My uncle sold most of the lot before the end of the summer and ended up writing me a check. Though it was considerably less than $40,000, it was still a life-changing amount of money for me. I was able to pay off my remaining student loans and put the rest towards a down payment on a new car. 5. I started my last job in 2017. I was a part-time warehouse worker who, over a few years, was promoted into a transport admin and management role. Myself and another colleague ran our department between us, only really reporting to our then line manager if we needed support with any part of our job, or time off, etc. But other than that, he trusted us completely to run things. It wasn't without its stressful days, but we had a really good thing going. Then in 2021, the business made some changes, moved our then line manager onto different departments, got a new designated manager just to manage us too and our department, we were naturally quite bitter about it, but nevertheless thought we'd give him a chance. He turned out to be an absolute control freak and a bully. But he was strange. He could be very supportive one minute, then a manipulative bully the next. He loved poking fun out of the fact I had a car accident last year. He loved solely targeting me for the bad jobs, and loved causing trouble between me and other colleagues. Then in March this year, my girlfriend fell ill whilst pregnant, and was forced to give birth to our son six weeks prematurely. It was quite an awful traumatic time, and I ended up having three weeks off work. When I returned, I had a mountain of work to catch up on that nobody covered in my absence, followed by me trying to catch up on it, and my manager pulling me away to do other projects for him, when his other two staff members weren't doing anything. Then, when my work was late, was forever kicking off at me that I couldn't manage my time properly, etc., etc. Then in May, he made a major mistake and pinned the blame on me for it. It caused issues between me and two colleagues I had to work closely with, and I was threatened with disciplinary action. Then I just got thinking to myself. Without me running his department, he has nothing. Without me, he wouldn't have a job. Without me, he wouldn't be able to explain what was going on with his department to senior management. How I ran his department for him on half of his salary. He takes all the glory and we get all the grief. I had one last run-in with him over this mistake he'd made, and handed my formal notice into him the following day. It was funny over those four weeks of serving my notice, just watching him slowly take over my responsibilities and struggling with them. Those responsibilities that he often told me, I don't even know what you do during the day. He had to then do the horrible jobs he used to pile on me. And on my final day in June, I told my fellow colleagues that I'll give him three months before he either quits or gets fired. Within the first few weeks, the department massively failed their monthly audit, which sparked attention of company directors who were sent in to investigate as this had never happened before. Then, bang on, a month later, I was on holiday and had one of the senior managers ringing me and texting me asking for passwords for systems. As my line manager had gone on holiday and hadn't organized anything, I ignored him because I didn't work there anymore and I was on holiday. Then he kept continuing to make mistakes. He hadn't ordered essential items, which caused trouble for the site. He didn't have a clue about the job in question as I originally was out to prove. Then a month after that, he was suspended from his duties pending further investigation, as management finally realized he couldn't do his job in question. Month after that, management claimed he quit with immediate effect. I think he was fired. But either way, my three months prediction was right, and he couldn't run that shift without me. It really is petty revenge quitting a job to prove a point, but it proved the point. Good riddance. I now run my own business, have a much better work-life balance, earning more than I could ever dream of in that place, and life is fantastic. 
Hey everybody, Halfraiser here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 313. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button, and share the video with friends and family. Also, if you'd like to get these videos a little bit early, then you can support me through my Patreon, which is linked in the description. Or I believe you could just search for Hellfreezer Patreon. You can support me there for as little as a dollar or more a month. I always like to joke that if I could get a single dollar every year from every subscriber I currently have, I could turn off ads, but, and of course we're not going to do quite that well here, but a dollar a month from a few hundred people would definitely help. Okay, I don't think there's any other business today. I think the next shout-out is next week. Uh, do, well, the next birthday shout-out is next week. Do I have a shout-out in this video? I do not. I do have at least one in on, though. That's fine. Okay, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Let me just take a look, because I did set up a room on the Discord so people can make suggestions. And this one comes from my moderator, Shigar. Shared today, actually. Do you say pecan with it ending in can, or do you pronounce it correctly like I just did with con? I'm joking, of course. Many words have multiple ways to pronounce them, and they're all wonderful and unique and special in their own way. And if you correct someone when it's just one of those words, you know, it has multiple accepted variations on the pronunciation, you might be a bit of a bot or a boot, depending on where you're from. So why don't you let me know what you think in a comment below, or feel free to share other words where you maybe have a, a less common pronunciation. Like, people often correct me on saying schedule, which is why I delight when I do American characters in stories and I say schedule just to mess with people. I look forward to reading your answers below. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.